Could I have your name and title, please? Dr. Lisa Bradley. I'm head of the Department of International Business at the University of Ulster's Business School. Lisa, the Vatican Bank is not a bank in the common sense of the word as we know it. Could you just explain what the institution is and how it works? Well, it's very interesting, Andrew. You've picked a, a really uh, intriguing subject there that has been the, uh, the interest of, of many people worldwide for a number of years. And in fact, one of the, the big issues with it is it's not even called the Vatican Bank. It's actually got, uh, called the Institute of Works for Religion, and it was founded in 1942. It performs functions very similar to the bank, which is why it has been got the tag Vatican Bank. But in fact, it's not essentially a bank at all, and that's one of the reasons why there's so much secrecy around how it works. Yes, um, so it's it, it's sort of re- really just a um, it's just a, a money pot where obviously the the Vatican's wealth comes from. Um, could you tell us what the bank's assets are used for? Well, interestingly, it's from our point of view, we would see it as a pot of money. From their perspective, and unlike the traditional description of a bank, it's actually considered a not-for-profit institution. In our minds, we would consider a, a bank to be a for-profit institution. And because it's not for profit, that means then that it doesn't have any shareholders and then it wouldn't pay out any dividends. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't create a surplus on its investments. But in fact, that surplus revenue is actually used to support religious works, charity works, pious activities, those sorts of elements. And in fact, it actually has what we would consider uh, over 33,000 accounts but again, because it's not necessarily a bank, they like to refer to those things as funds. So you as an account holder, in fact, you actually have to be interviewed and show ID um, by the representatives from the institution to even open an account. But you're essentially a, a fund holder in that. Um, the total assets, and again, because it's not a, a public in, uh, institution in the sense of most banks, we don't actually have the full information on the size of its assets. But they are estimated to be over €6 billion. Euros. Right. So, who can who can open an account in these in this bank? Who is it? Just or parishes, or is it, is it ordinary it, people? Who can open a fund? Is probably the a fund, way sorry, to yes. to it. Um, essentially, the head of that uh, institution would be the Pope. And in normal instances, if you were running a bank, you would have a traditional board of directors, and the board of directors represents the interests of the shareholders. So when you apply that to something like the, the Vatican Bank, you're actually looking at, instead of a board of directors, you're looking at a, uh, of a panel which is made up of very senior um, religious figures like cardinals within the state. Okay, they um, would then manage and represent the interests of all the fund holders, which of course will actually be, for instance, the heads of um, religious institutions, maybe in other parts of the world. But certainly you would, you're only allowed to open a fund there if you're considered... Um, by the religious order to be a very senior official within uh, that, that institution. Okay, and are the bank's assets directly linked to the economy of the Vatican State? Well, that's again goes into a, a, another issue as well, and that's the fact that what we have is we have the, the religious institution or the, or the Holy See, and, and on a separate side you have what's called the Vatican City State. Now, the Vatican City State is actually um, it's a landlocked state within the city of Rome, and it's the smallest independent state in the world. So it actually means it would regulate itself, it means it would investigate itself, and it would set up its own institutions. It actually has um, it, it, its own relatively large economy, actually, for the, for the size of the, the land that it, that it considers. But in most institutions or most states, you would have what's called a central bank. So in our, in our perspective, we would have the central bank, and the central bank would set interest rates, and we would have Mervyn King, who quite often make um, announcements about um, what they expect the interest rate would be, and for instance, they would support maybe some government policy like they've done recently with uh, increasing or generating wealth in the economy. Within the Vatican city-state, it doesn't have a central bank. Instead, it has essentially a central bank function that's regulated uh, with the monetary agreement between the EU and itself. It actually has the euro as the official currency. And actually, its economy runs on the fact that um, it makes sufficient income, for example, from the, um, the selling of entry fees to a number of its museums. It's certainly it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and extremely popular with tourists who then would buy postcards and stamps just so they could have the, the Vatican State um, logo on the stamps. 
um, coins, mementos, tourist items, which is actually how the, the Vatican State itself functions is from that income. Remember, of course, that the Vatican Bank is actually an institution within the, the, the religious order. Okay, and what do, what influence does the Vatican Bank and the Vatican City State economy have on a global scale? Well, I suppose it's, it's, it depends what, what you mean by the word influence. One of the things that's been very interesting by the Vatican State is it has certainly increased a significant interest if you're an author or you're a writer because it provides a great background to a number of, of stories and you can think of the likes of the Da Vinci Code and other elements um, because of the secrecy that surrounds how it exists. So from that point of view, um, the influence it could be seen uh, as, as being quite wide. It also has been uh, a function of, uh, of a number of investigations, for example, by the EU. And that is due to the fact that because of the secrecy, there, there will always be questions around how the institution works, and in particular issues around money laundering. And again, obviously being based in Italy, then you get the rumours about the mafia. I, mean, I think it's important to note that they actually haven't been um, accused of... Uh, there's been no findings as a result of, of a number of investigations, but I know at the moment they're still embroiled in a, a large investigation, and their focus has seemed to be now to improve the issue of transparency. Now, that's not... Um, uh, unexpected, because given the financial situation since 2007 and 2008 with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the effect it would have had worldwide, there is no doubt the global economy is looking much closer at how funds, how financial institutions work, what's happening to people's money, what's happening to people's investment. And as, as a result of that, the Vatican Bank would be considered to be, to be part of that opening up of transparency and ensuring, for example, that there isn't money laundering going on. However, because it is within the state, because it doesn't have shareholders, it doesn't pay dividends, you wouldn't be exposed to the same amount of regulatory pressures, for example. So if you're a public bank, you would be required to publish accounts every so often and reports and shareholders at meetings and annual, annual reports and uh, uh, those sorts of things. But because it's, it's essentially a, a private organization, then they're only accountable to the organization's members, which are, of course, members of the religious orders. They've also obviously been part then of a lot, large discussion, particularly within the EU, of the need for reform and how important it is within the EU to ensure that financial crime is actually prevented because that's extremely costly um, to the economy. So from that point of view, it provides a lovely case study as regards issues or possibilities of how financial crime could exist but certainly to date they haven't actually um uh, they've been accused of a number a number of issues but they haven't actually had any sanctions brought against them on that so um given the uh the need for more transparency among banks and companies alike um, i've actually literally uh, yesterday just been uh, investigating tax evasion, we've heard about Starbucks, Amazon, Facebook, all you know evading tax through tax havens and things like that. Can you see in the future the Vatican Bank? Obviously, it's a very secret society. Nobody knows how much how many billions are in there. Can you see in the future the EU um, sort of forcing that a bit more transparency on them? Well, it's very interesting because when you pay tax, you pay it to the state. So if they were an institution, for example, in Italy, then they would be required to pay um, any cost, for example, to the Italian government. However, you can see that um, in this example, it's not accountable to Italian government. It's accountable to the Vatican State. So only the Vatican State could then essentially ask it to be more transparent. And given the interconnectedness between the two, it would be quite unlikely that that would actually happen. OK, that's not a problem. Thank, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, you've been very helpful. That, OK, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> thank you. All the best. OK, take care. Bye. All right, bye.